Hey you guys, welcome back to the channel, Michael Clarida Arts. I am, of course, Michael Clarida. So today we're going to do something a little bit different, but also a little bit the same. You guys know that this channel really is focused on drawing. I have done quite a few reviews here and there of different products uh, as it pertains to art and illustration. Um, but also, you know, we've done tutorials, we've done drawing. Man, there's over 600 videos on this channel. So today we're going to be doing something, um, of course, different, but also, like I said, the same. Uh, we're going to be doing a uh, draw over uh, of a sketch that uh, I did last season uh, of a Yeti. You guys know that I love uh, doing Bigfoots and Yetis and uh, working uh, in Photoshop and hopefully you guys will learn something as I go through the process of sketching and drawing and narrating and talking. We've done this whole process before as I've done 12 days of Yeti. My goodness, 12 days. Um, and I've shown you guys different processes, different programs that I utilize. And today's, again, going to be something kind of in that same vein. Um, I will be working uh, in Photoshop, like I said, and possibly also in Clip Studio Paint. We'll see. I want to try to keep it in one program. Um, it is, of course, winter time, and this recording is on the 22nd of December, and it is very cold uh, here in the mountains, uh, Appalachian Mountains. It will be getting colder, so hopefully, um, uh, you know, you won't see me become an icicle. That's one of the reasons why I have my hat on, my stylish hat. Here in my studio, I do have heat, but it is an older house built in the 50s. It's on a farm and uh, the floor is not insulated. So <laughs> it gets kind of cold in here, especially whenever it gets down to like zero. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. And here we are inside of Photoshop. I'm running the most current iteration of Photoshop. I do have the Adobe Creative Suite subscription. And for those of you who do have that, um, you know that it is a monthly fee. They went to a subscription-based model uh, a few years back, and um, you know a lot of people complained, but at the end of the day, if you're a professional like me, it is a tax write-off, which is awesome. So, Freddy, Freddy the Yeti. I have done numerous uh, sketches of this particular character, and I love the expression that I get into this character, um, especially during the holiday season. Uh, I've drawn him and drawn him and drawn him um, numerous times and I finally landed on this particular uh, character design and I did uh, 12 days of Yeti. Uh, I might be able to pull up, let me see if I can pull up some of the Yeti sketches that I've done here so you guys can have context. I always, <coughs> excuse me, I always like to give context if I can. <laughs> of course I'm looking here and I don't see, let's go down here. Typically, I've got, I've got it, oh, it might be on my desktop. That's where it might be. Here I am looking on the file. So, Freddy, sh 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 demos. Okay, Freddy, Yeti's, Freddy, Yeti sketch. So, yeah, I'll, what I'll do is I'll just, so here's tree. Here's one that I just finished recently. For those of you who visit my channel, you can look back in the history and you can see this particular piece that I inked and colored, and if we go on down to some of the other faces, beans, you can see that I really love drawing. <laughs> Here we go. Here's the Yeti sketches, so you can kind of give um, as you see, my computer just froze. There we go. So here are some of the sketches that I did, you know, of Freddy. Carrying a tree, here's his Christmas sweater, here he is going down a hill. And some of these are half finished. Um, I have actually finished all of them. <laughs> this is an older file. But you gotta give understanding and context. And this is a this, this one's done actually traditionally. Um, and here is Freddy in his uh, native environment in the forest. I just love putting animals on clothes. It's kind of one of my fun things that I love to do. Um, and I'm working on, uh, like I said, I'm working in Photoshop and working on my Surface Studio. So this particular machine I have reviewed um, initial 
swing, and then I did a follow-up uh, review of this machine, and overall, I, I give it an A. Um, what would make it an A plus is if the battery life was a little bit better, you know, the fan noise and the palm rejection was a little bit better. Uh, but overall, it is a fantastic machine, and I encourage you, if you're in the market for a all-in-one, that you consider the Surface Line. You know, there is something called the Microsoft Tax, similar to the Apple Tax, and that comes um, whenever these larger companies manufacture and make these products, and they put their name on them because, you know, they're who they are, and they can charge a premium for it. Microsoft is no different than Apple. Apple's tax is massive. And Microsoft, their Surface Line, even though good, does have its flaws. And hopefully, um, you know, if you watch that video, you see some of those. I recently had an issue with, I'm just going to be talking here while I draw, an issue with um, one of my products uh, that I've utilized here in the studio in my Surface Book. And I noticed that the battery was starting to have a little bit of an issue. And battery, you're like, well, that's fine. You know, go ahead and replace the battery because... You know, you can buy that stuff. Well, it's not that easy because they manufacture these products to not be serviceable. And you're like, what? The Surface can't be serviced? It's not really a serviceable device. If you have a lot of courage and electronic know-how and patience, yeah, you can you can open the device up and and replace the battery because they do sell the battery by itself. But here's the, the little side note. It's extremely hard. I mean, massively hard. And you can break something, right? And in addition to that, it's actually kind of dangerous. I'm saying actually a lot. Sorry about that. It is pretty dangerous. And you're saying, what do you mean danger? Well, it has a lithium ion battery in it. And if you puncture the battery or if you tear the battery or if you expose the battery to moisture or... Uh, an electrical current, it could actually explode. I said actually again. It could explode, and that's not something that I wanted to do. So what I did is I just kind of threw caution to the wind, and I opened up the machine and replaced the battery. And I ended up inadvertently prying a little bit too hard on the corner, and it damaged one of the digitizers on the screen, so now it doesn't have touch on part of the screen. <laughs> But everything else works great, and it charges, and I was able to get it repaired, which is really awesome. Um, and sitting here trying to get this done, and I was able to fix it. So, gosh, you're saying, well, that was kind of a pointless story. No, because most of the time, people are going to look at that device, and, and since the battery did swell, and it popped the screen right off of the base and I found out and for those of you who have surface devices you know that a surface book with performance base the original surface book one back in 2015 2016 was about twenty three hundred dollars and you're thinking wow that is a lot of money and yeah it is for an all-in-one especially back then and it lasted roughly three and a half years four years and then it started having issues, and then they don't update that machine anymore because it doesn't have the latest and greatest processor. <laughs> you know, it has a, a seventh generation. Think about that. Seventh generation i7, and I couldn't update to Windows 11. That was kind of poopy. So, yeah. And you're like, well, why did you buy the new Surface device? Well, first of all, it's awesome. The one that I'm working on today. It runs full applications, and you're like, yeah, man, why don't you buy an iPad? I do have an iPad Pro 12.9 inch, and it is a wonderful machine. Never going to knock on Apple for their prowess and uh, ability to make a great device. But again, that's expensive, and it doesn't run full apps. Apps applications like Photoshop and Illustrator. And they say no, Photoshop does run on the new, you know, latest and greatest iPad and it's the full version. No, it's not. It's not the full version. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't have all its bells and whistles and the interface is a little bit different. And um, it's just not the same. 
even though the newest iPad, uh, I believe, has an M1 chip, M2 chip. I don't know what it is. And it has the capability, but it just, they want to keep those things separate. And that's, I guess, okay. I'm not going to argue with them. Like, take my money. But today is going to be about this guy right here. So this particular um, file I set up at 300 DPI. Let's go to the image size. Let's check the image size. We're at 10 by 10 square. And uh, this is kind of the MO, the modus operandi that I utilize whenever I start little projects like this. Um, this, of course, started as well, started as a just a doodle, which happens a lot with me. I'll start out with doodles. And I'll kind of move into a more complex illustration. And that's where this whole idea set up came about. You know, with Yeti and 12 Days of Yeti. I originally just doodling. And I do that a lot. <laughs> I doodle on my computer. I doodle on my logbook that I have for my work. I just doodle, doodle, doodle. And I have a sketchbook that I doodle in. And I'm constantly... How do I put it? I, I utilize doodling as a resource and outlet to help me figure out complex problems. And, you know, especially whenever I'm working for somebody, I'll doodle something completely unrelated. And then it'll give me the ability to let my brain rest on that particular idea while I'm working on something else. And then eventually this other entity that I've been working on, which is like the Yeti and basically everything in my studio, um, I will then go back and look at what I did and just realize, you know, wow, some of those, those are my ideas. And, you know, I'm not working on something for somebody else. It's mine. So that's basically where Freddie came about. If you follow me on social media, uh, I believe it's at Michael Clarda. Time for a social media plug. It's coming. Social media plug. So on my Instagram, at Mike Clarda, I post my daily thoughts, my fun illustrations, my sketches. I very rarely post work because I'm under such uh, ironclad NDAs. <laughs> and if I were to post work, then the people that pay me to do work for them would say, what are you doing? We're going to sue your pants off. And that is not a good thing. So I very rarely post work unless I'm given explicit permission. And <clears throat> I do enough work on the side that... I can almost post every single day something fun. And I encourage you, if you're kind of looking for that answer for creativity and you're like, I don't know how to get past these blocks. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. And my my philosophy is, um, you know, always trying to better yourself in some capacity, whether it's drawing, whether it's sketching, uh, or, or learning a new program or whatever it is, always, you know, look for something, uh, to kind of better yourself. You don't have to do it all at once. Heaven forbid, you don't, you know, want to sit there and have to, oh, I got to draw something today. I have to do this. I have to do that. No, you don't have to do anything except realize that you're, only human. You can only do so much in one day. And as soon as you realize that, then you say, okay, well, I'll do a little bit today, a little, a little bit tomorrow, a little bit the next day. And suddenly you realize after a whole year, that's what I did. So <laughs> I did something every single day and I looked around and I had this huge stack of stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh, I got so much that I've been working on. And I didn't really pay attention because it was one of those moments uh, in my life when, when, uh, you know, you kind of look around, you're like, I really haven't done anything. And which is completely untrue because we all, you know, have uh, moments in our lives when 
you know, we reflect and do things. And this is whenever I was coming up on 40 in my midlife crisis. And, <laughs> and I was like, I need to do something else. And that's what I did. I looked at the body of work that I had completed in that, in my, in my sketch time. And I started posting stuff every day. And that's actually how I got the job at Disney is people saw that on LinkedIn and I didn't hashtag anybody. I just started doing it. And people over at Disney saw me because I already had connections with um, quite a few Disney people. And, uh, you know, Disney people saw that. And then Universal people saw that. And then it was, you know, this this person has a degree of creativity that I haven't seen um, in its consistency and the randomness. And that's another thing. I'm a generalist, so I do a lot of different methodologies and work in a lot of different programs. And I was doing, gosh, so many different types of things from digital illustration to traditional illustration. You know, I was even doing some uh, like chainsaw carving and painting and graphic design and logo work and package design and toy illustration and toy design. And whenever you have somebody that has the ability to really switch gears and also be a character artist and have things that are accurate and you know, that really opened a lot of doors for me because a lot of people ask, how are, you know, how did you have the ability to do so much for so many different companies? And it's because I treated it, I treated all the projects very similarly in effect that they're art. And if I didn't know how to do something such as uh, sculpt something or utilize a program, then I would take the time out and I would learn how to do it. And I think that's kind of lost. Um, I'm not going to put down on any current generation because they're much smarter than I ever dreamed of being at that age and much more creative and they have access to much more information. But I think that the, the overall spectrum of learning something and then failing at it very quickly you know, a lot of, you know, my son in particular, he'll try something and if he doesn't succeed at it very quickly, he'll move on because he didn't have success at it. And that is really kind of uh, a challenge um, for any generation. But in today's generation, that moves so quickly because we've been conditioned so much by social media and fast food, not fast food, but getting everything really quickly. If you fail at something, then you think you're a failure. Or if you fail at something, you don't like that feeling and it's not something you want to continue. You know, my philosophy is, well, then you just have to fail faster. And that's something that I really kind of took as my, my mantra, fail faster. You fail faster, then you'll get to the success part a lot quicker. Um, and that's, you know, that's true. Whoops. That's a little bit too big. Whoops, a little bit smaller. Yeah, fail faster. <laughs> it, it, it. What is going on? Okay, there we go. Nope. I used the eraser and it messed everything up. What is going on? What is going on? I used the eraser and it completely messed everything up. Hmm. File, save. We're going to go ahead and save. And then we're going to quit. And we're going to come back into the program. This, Unfortunately, um, this is what happens sometimes, especially whenever I work on a PC. Um, mm -hmm. PCs do weird things, and uh, that's just something that I've accepted. You know, I don't have a lot of issues on my Macintosh. Not like this. Not weird things. That's interesting. Soft tonic. I don't even know what that is. Again, <laughs> see? Weird things happening. Pop-ups. Just things constantly happening on the PC. Okay, let's go back in. So as you see, um, I'm just going in and, and taking my time. Doesn't work anymore. 
My pen stopped working. The eraser works great. See? Now this doesn't work at all. Brush tool. What is going on? Hmm. So the drawing feature no longer works. And I don't know why. It doesn't work at all. Okay. Nope. My pen stopped working. All right. So we're going to be right back. Okay. So occasionally uh, I talk about this in my videos. You have something that is uh, very prominent in the art world and in human in the human world in general, and it's called user error. <laughs> As you see now, my pen works great. It's because I had sized, so I can size my uh, mouse. I have a little device right here. This is an XP pen quick key device. See it? There we go. That's a little bit better. And I can use the scroll wheel to turn uh, the brush size. And I had done that whenever I was using the eraser. And of course, here it works great. But when I size it into oblivion, it doesn't work. So it was just too small. <laughs> so now I can go back. Here we are on my layer. And I can continue with my drawing. Okay. I didn't get that. Could you... <laughs> yeah, you didn't hear me say the uh, catchphrase, hey, S-E-S-U-R-I. You didn't hear me say that. And it's listening. Device is always listening. So, yeah, having some fun, drawing some Yeti, sketching things out. Here's my initial sketch right here. You can see, just very simple, used very simple shape language. Um, Freddy is friendly, so he's round and soft. I've designed him in such a way that he doesn't have a lot of harsh elements to him. And yeah, so like right here, I can see that his chin needs to come down a little bit further. One of the things that I, I express to students and uh, you guys as well is trying new things is a good thing, right? New way of doing things, um, new applications, new computers, new things, new books, new, new things uh, to you. Not particularly new per se, but new to you. He's got a finger under here that needs to come around because he's got a hidden finger. Because he's got one, two, three, and his hands kind of twisted a little bit. Um, yeah, new things, uh, figuring out how to do um, different techniques and whatnot is what I'm constantly striving for. And I definitely recommend that if you have the opportunity to, you know, go and experiment with different hardware, right? Hardware, software, definitely try it. We all get locked into that zone, meaning the way that I do things. That's just the way that I do things. That's, you know, I've been doing that for 10 years and it works for me. I've whittled down all the ways not to do it. And now this is the way that sticks with me. Well, I think there's a lot of benefits to that, but it also, also kind of makes you a little rigid and it makes your artwork um, a little less lively. You know, Bob Ross, we all know who that is, the man who stole his technique. <laughs> a lot of you guys probably don't know that. He stole his technique from a different person and he made it his own. He actually kind of stole his look too. Um, just the, you know, the format, not his physical look, but the, the way his channel was, or no channel, the way his uh, show was set up. And, you know, he, he got into a, a spot where he, he didn't do a lot of experimentation and change and that's fine. But, you know, Bob Ross says, happy accidents, happy accidents. And we all need some happy 
I don't want to have too many accidents, but yeah, having a happy accident is actually a good thing, right? If you, if you mess up on something and you can, I remember one of my teachers, um, when I was in college, he, he, you know, he would say accidents are a good thing because you can work through them and determine how, and a lot of times it's a good thing. If you spill something on there, then you have to, you have to make do. That's what's great about traditional art. If you make a mistake, then you can, uh, you can make it work. Um, and maybe it'll make your drawing for illustration a little bit better. Or maybe it'll completely mess it up. See, I'm keeping things really loose. I like loose illustration. I do think that there, I have done really tight illustration. I've done, gosh, done a lot of really tight illustrations because that's, you know, when I'm working for somebody, they have a specific look and you have to adhere to the look and that's completely fine. But in my, my private work, which is what this is, I like keeping things very loose. Mostly because I have a raging case of ADD and it's very hard for me to stay focused on one project. I used to work on like four and five projects whenever I was working at the studio and, you know, it'd always be good, uh, for my bosses because they would come around and they would see, Oh, you're working on this. And I was always working on something different. And it's because that I, I, I almost didn't have the ability, um, to focus. So I'd work on something different. Now, if, if the, uh, timeline was really abbreviated, which happened a lot, I would, I would, uh, you know, endeavor to work on something uh, and stay focused. But again, it's, it's very hard for me to stay focused. And a lot of times I'll get up and I'll go do things and I'll go read a book or do an, like what I talked about at the beginning of the, of the video, do a, a, a sketch that really takes my mind off of, you know, the massive deadline and the ramifications if I don't meet that deadline. So anyway, yeah, working in Photoshop is fun. Don't, don't be too worried, uh, especially in the digital environment. You can make a lot of mistakes. Oh my gosh, what did I do? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What did I just do? I can get rid of my mistakes? Absolutely, there is a history. And you can determine how many histories that you have in Photoshop and other programs as well. And it really gives you a lot of freedom to make a mistake, right? We're always... I think as artists putting a lot of pressure on ourselves to do things quote unquote right. You know, I, I recently saw everybody up in arms about the AI art and I am totally on board with that. I think AI art is a thing that obviously exists, but you're relying upon a engine uh, to piece together other people's artwork to create something new. Now you could, you could argue, well, we do that with reference, but it goes through a human experience model, right? Whereas the uh, AI engine does a lot of uh, picking and random and placing things together without emotion and without feeling. And I think that that is where a lot of people are going to have issues with it because it, it doesn't give any, how do I put it? It doesn't give that human emotion that, you know, we could look at something and say, oh, that person spent, you know, 65 hours on that piece and, and, uh, you know, the, the AI engine will just pull it and rip it apart and place it back together. And I, I at first was like, well, you know, AI is going to happen whether you like it or not. You know, I remember whenever clip art came, back in the late eighties, mid, mid to late eighties. And it's very similar, um, because it has a ramification of hurting the industry that I love. You know, you'll have art directors. that will just say, just put it in the AI engine, you know, pull something. I just need something right now. I need something within three seconds, <laughs> five seconds, 10 seconds. And you'll put in your description and the AI will spit something out and they'll accept it. But art, it flat, it's like a big 
organic machine that flexes and it comes out and then it flexes in, then it comes out and it's constantly changing. And whether we like it or not, AI art is here to stay. And, uh, I, I've seen quite a few people that have posted stuff recently and they have hashtagged themselves as a quote unquote creative. And that's a question. Where do we draw that line in terms of creativity, in terms of art? Where's that line drawn between accepting a machine created image as art? You know, art can be defined in many different ways. Depends on who you are as an individual, whether or not you are an artist yourself. Um, and we could definitely think. Uh, in this time that AI art, art bad, AI art bad. And I, and I definitely think that is the case right now, but there will be a time when art directors will no longer source that. They'll no longer source the AI art. Just they'll want something real, something hand done, something created. You're seeing kind of a revolution of hand done stuff as well, you know, from uh, different shops on Etsy and uh, paintings. I mean, recently I sold a, a hand done painting and people want that. They don't want that sterilization that you get from the AI uh, engine. Uh, you know, the big companies would probably want it because it, it boosts their profits. And they don't have to pay artists to, to sit down and think and create and interact. They can just put a description and, or even take a scan. I saw this this morning. Somebody took a scan and they plugged it into the AI engine and psh, out came a beautiful piece of artwork and it was original uh you know original in the context of you know bringing stuff together and, and basically stealing and taking art but uh other people's artwork and doing it but i'm just i'm anxious to see where it goes um i'm not going to get enthralled and embrawled in conversations pertaining to ai art um i'm just going to keep doing what i do you know and hopefully eventually it'll come to its its uh its balance and uh we'll definitely start seeing i wonder if it ever goes to court right it'll ever go to court this image is copyrighted it took from over 350,000 artists you all have to pay fees to those artists because you you took actually took part of their image and used it in your image so i'm i'm anxious to see where it goes um and how it affects my industry. So that's my two cents on AI art. And I'm sticking to it. All right. So now I'm going to do just get a little bit of. I call these. Like just context lines and plain lines. I'm keeping the. I kind of slanted. I need to go ahead and balance that out on the right hand side. You can see. We're going to balance it right here. I kind of messed up a little bit. There we go. And there he is. He's so cute. He's so cute. He's so cute. So a lot of people ask me about this brush. And, and, and I've talked about this particular brush before. This is um, from Aaron Blaze's Custom Brushes 1. You get this set whenever you sign up for their newsletter at creatureartteacher.com. And you sign up their newsletter, you get a PDF about elephants, and you get this brush set, which includes Pastel C. He created this brush, and it's one of my favorite brushes. Uh, I actually have a version of this brush on my main machine that I utilize, because even though this is a good brush, I change it, right? We all change if you haven't changed it, then I would explore changing it because it is a great brush. But, you know, make it your own. But I would never, because people ask me, well, let's just post the brush. That would take Aaron Blaze out of the equation. And I did not create this brush. I got this brush by doing something for him, which was to give him my email address. So he can send me stuff about his channel and about products he sells. He's a wonderful uh, illustrator and artist that worked for Disney for years and years, and he does tutorials and has a business based out of uh, Apopka, Florida. And he does a wonderful job um, inspiring and uh, teaching people how to draw. And this brush is a freebie, 
which is nice. He does charge for other brush packs and reference packs and videos and all that other stuff. So go check him out, creatureartteacher.com. Um, he's a great uh, narrator, and he's got a lot of experience and a lot of wisdom to pass on to people like you and I who are... Um, you know, still finding their way in this great, big, wonderful world of art. All right. So as you see, I've talked my way into the finished line work. And it is rough. I mean, it's rough. It's rough because I like it rough. No, it's rough because I like the line quality being really not so sterile and tight. I like that hand-done quality, the sketch quality that this particular style offers along with this brush. I think his hands are a little bit too small. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you guys on a little bit of a time lapse and I'm going to go in and fix some of the issues um, that I have with this particular illustration. And hopefully you guys will enjoy my drawing of Freddy the Yeti untangling some light something that's relatable that's one of the things too that i talk about in my career especially whenever i'm teaching somebody you don't want to create an illustration that people can't relate to right i can't tell you how many times students would create something that only they can see and they would have to explain the piece now there's nothing wrong with explanation of a piece i'm not downplaying that aspect of art you just don't understand me I'm being tortured for my artwork. Well, you can be tortured, but you're going to be only only you're not the only one being tortured because other people don't understand what you're doing. Um, and you know that's oh I forgot to do okay. That's one of the things that that I think we as artists really need to endeavor to do is to make sure that our art is understandable and relatable. Right, not, not creating something that doesn't relate or doesn't click with somebody doesn't make your art exclusive or special. It makes it <sighs> unrelatable and hard to read. Um, and and you know we want we want our art to be seen. We want it to be relatable because we want it to get to more people, and you know want it to be. Uh, if you're doing it for a living, you want it to be sold because you want to be paid. But <laughs> you, you guys understand what I'm saying, right? So we've all been in the situation where we take out the Christmas lights and we can't, for the life of us, get it right. It, it just takes time. Why do they get so tangled? I did a perfect knot whenever I put them away last year. You know, it's similar to whenever you put socks in a dryer and they come out and you can't find the other sock, right? <laughs> so relatable that relatable uh, aspect is something that you know you want to consider whenever you do a piece you know i got this hand around here and i got this over here and it goes here and there trying to figure out where this is what is going on i just don't get it so let's go ahead and get you guys on time lapse we're gonna go ahead and block in the color uh i will stay in photoshop this time because i don't want for you to get confused and be like, wait a minute, he switched programs. I'm totally confused. So we're going to go ahead and do that. And we'll do a simple wrap up at the end. And that'll be the Christmas illustration. Okay. Enjoy. <laughs>
pretty much wraps up today's video. Man, what a time I had doing this piece. As you see, I am no longer on my PC because my Surface did some weird things. I'd be drawing and then the pen would stop working and then the touch would stop working. And I'm like, okay, so I tried to figure things out and I ended up completely resetting the machine and got everything reinstalled and I started doing, you know, doing the video again and drawing and the same thing happened. So I'm thinking maybe because of the copious amounts of drivers that are always being updated, I think something has happened uh, in the updating process because I've never had any issues with the, um, with the touch on my Surface Laptop Studio. You know, <laughs> as you see it, it's... It's right here in all of its glory. Um, you know, I did a review about the machine on the machine a while back, and I said that it was a fantastic machine, no issues, and I even did an update recently. So I think something happened in the midterm whenever they did some driver updates. So I don't want to focus on that, but I had a really good time doing the drawing. I stuck in Photoshop this time, um, which I noticed, you know, whenever I do drawings and stuff, I'll use multiple programs because there are certain aspects of different programs that I'll utilize that I really like. And I'm sure Photoshop, you can do the things in Clip Studio Paint. But Clip Studio Paint, for me, is a great color block-in program. I've used it for years, and I just go over and I transfer the file, and it takes me a few minutes to block in all the color. But, um, you know, this particular drawing uh, and, and color block-in and illustration and rendering has a specific style to it. You know, I encourage you to find what you like and experiment with different programs and different styles and different aspects of, of how you do things. Um, you know, this has a real sketchy, textury quality to it that um, I really love. You know, I kind of tend to go towards that traditional look, that traditional look of pen and ink, of crayon, of colored pencil. I've always liked that. It really gives it a hand-done feeling. So that's it for today. Um, I've got other videos in the queue that I haven't <laughs> that I haven't edited in because of the season. Of course, it is the Christmas season, and this particular drawing really exemplifies that being uh, Freddy the Yeti, um, and you know, showing like I talked before, showing uh, an aspect of the holidays which we all can hopefully relate to, which is. <sighs> you know, decoration and if you do celebrate Christmas. So anyway, that's all I had for you guys today. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. Please like and subscribe uh, if you like what you see. And, uh, you know, I always throw in a, a little catchphrase at the end, or I try to, something that really tries to help you guys out. Here we are at 2022, at the end of 2022, and, uh, you know, keep chasing and drawing those horizons. You know, there's always that next step we can take to better ourselves and whether it's a tutorial whether it's a video whether it's a share whether it's sitting down and trying something new hopefully in this holiday season you'll really enjoy um, you know your friends and family and and, and and you know some of the things that you may get <laughs> so anyway thank you guys and we'll see you next time okay